They are a Florida icon, smart, agile, and playful. Dolphins have sparked the imaginations of many, and their undersea world might be linked with ours more than we know. We look at the bottomless dolphins as very good sentinels of the health of the coastal ecosystem. Dolphins are a barometer. They're an apex predator in an environment that we all share. They're breathing the same air that we breathe. They're swimming through the same water in which we swim. They're eating the same fish that we catch. And granted, we're not in the water as much as they are, and we're not eating as many of the fish, but if problems were going to show up, we would expect them to show up in the dolphins first. For decades, toxic chemicals have made their way into the oceans, leaving fish and marine mammals vulnerable. Dolphins that have washed up in various places, including the southeast United States, they have to be treated as toxic waste. The levels of contaminants are so high. Some animals show disturbing signs of immune system dysfunction and disease, which may be linked to contaminant exposure. They're kind of like the 400-pound miner's canary. Um, these animals are telling us what's happening. We've used the oceans as our toilet for centuries, and now I think we're starting to see the effects of that through all these new health issues that are coming up. So if these dolphins here on our coastlines, these apex predators, they're getting sick, well, who's next? And it's the humans. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. Bottlenose dolphins are common in Florida waters. They are social animals which eat about 20 pounds of fish a day and can live to be over 50. Dolphins have few natural predators other than man. As the population along Florida's coastline increases, so do the threats to the curious marine mammals. Uh, increased boating traffic leads to boat hits. Dolphins are increasingly entangled in fishing line or ingesting the fishing gear that leads to their slow and painful death. And not all threats to the animals are as obvious. Contaminants which are lurking beneath the surface are also impacting the marine mammals' long-term health. In the coastal waters off Miami, Scientists with NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service have been studying bottlenose dolphins for more than 15 years. Did you see him again yet? Oh, there he is, Joe. A photo ID study helps the researchers gather information about the resident dolphins. The dolphins get natural markings and nicks and scar patterns on their dorsal fin. We take photographs of those. Then back at the lab, we can match animals up to the photo ID catalog, and that's what allows us to follow the population over time to understand their movement patterns. I think we got them pretty good, huh? Through observation, the scientists discovered that the animals live in distinct areas. Certain animals tended to be sighted primarily in the northern half of the bay by the city of Miami and the port of Miami, where other dolphins tended to be more in the south towards Card Sound. The northern half of the bay is close to urban development, while the southern half is mainly surrounded by agriculture. To find out if the northern group of animals has higher levels of contaminants than the southern dolphins, the experts collected small blubber samples. All right, the next one he comes up, I'm gonna take a shot. We fire a small dart with a stainless steel sampling head. 
that hits the dolphin and has a float to keep it from going too deep and allows the dart to bounce off. The dart then floats and we're able to pick it up and retrieve the sample. And it's only about a centimeter in diameter. It's a very small sample. The biopsy samples were analyzed for a group of contaminants called persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, which have been found in marine mammals around the world. We looked at over 80 compounds, um, PCB congeners, DDTs, which are pesticides, and also the PBDEs, which are flame retardants. The PCBs historically were used in industry in things like transformers and have been banned from production but are still found in some older transformers and equipment today. DDT is a pesticide made infamous in the 1960s when its harmful effects on human health and the environment became known. The use of it and PCBs was banned in the United States in the 1970s. But these compounds degrade very slowly. Transported by wind and ocean currents, high levels of these toxins can still be found in the environment today, in as far away places as the Arctic. These chemicals are very, very persistent in the environment and we're still finding them in organisms all over the world. Another potentially harmful group of contaminants called PBDEs are still legally produced in most U.S. states. The flame retardants are currently produced today and we're concerned about those because they're very similar in structure to PCBs. They persist in the environment, they can be toxic, they are known to transport around the world in a similar way that PCBs did. And they're found in our homes on a regular basis now. They're in our electronics, in our furniture, in our carpet, in our cars, used as flame retardants widely. Exposure to these chemicals has been linked to a number of health problems. All of those chemicals have been identified as most likely endocrine disruptors. They can impact the immune system. They can decrease reproductive success. They can cause problems with the hormones, such as estrogen levels and thyroid hormones. They can also impact neurological development. So they are definitely compounds of concern for both dolphins as well as humans. Marine mammals are especially vulnerable to these pollutants because they bioaccumulate in the animal's blubber. The organic pollutants bind to fat cells, and so they'll be bound to particles in the sediment, and then the small organisms that feed off the sediments will accumulate the contaminants from the sediment. The larger fish eat the smaller fish, and it continues to accumulate up the food chain because those contaminants are binding in the fat stores. So the animals that are on the top of the food chain are getting much larger doses that have been accumulated through the food chain over time, and that's true for both dolphins and humans. There we go. In Miami's Biscayne Bay, scientists discovered that the northern group of dolphins did have higher levels of most contaminants than the southern group. We found that the northern group had extremely high levels of PCBs, and in fact, the males in the northern half of the bay had five times higher PCBs than those in the southern half of the bay. As a matter of fact, the dolphins in northern Biscayne Bay have the highest levels of PCBs of all the dolphins studied in Florida. I would expect higher levels of contaminants here because of a higher urban area, more industrial inputs. Even going back in the 60s and 70s, Miami was much more populated than some of these other areas of Florida. Since dolphins and humans eat some of the same fish, several people have questioned the levels of contaminants in humans. To get some answers, the Centers for Disease Control is now conducting a pilot study of local fishermen in Biscayne Bay to test if they too have high levels of persistent organic pollutants in their bodies. POPs have been linked to a slew of health problems in people. And according to the Environmental Protection Agency, humans are mainly exposed to POPs through contaminated foods. I certainly am a lot more careful about how much seafood I eat of various kinds. The fish offer a lot in terms of health benefits, but they also offer a lot of threats when you start looking at the contaminants that are found in them. All right, Jace, you got the bow line? Got it, ready? Okay. Dr. Randall Wells heads the world's longest running dolphin research program in Sarasota Bay on Florida's west coast. 
The Sarasota Dolphin Research Program, under the auspices of the Dolphin Research and Conservation Institute of the Chicago Zoological Society, has been based here at Moat Marine Laboratory actually since its start back in 1970. There it is. We have a span of five generations that we're currently observing out in Sarasota Bay as long-term residents as part of a community. Each year, researchers conduct a health assessment of the area's dolphins. The health assessment involves finding a selected group of dolphins in shallow water and setting a net around that group of dolphins and working with each individual one at a time on a specially designed veterinary examination boat. We take a suite of measurements, a suite of samples, we mark the animal if it's not already recognizable to us and then release it right there on site. One of the challenges scientists face is determining what levels of toxins are harmful to the dolphin's health since they can't do experiments on the animals. Studies have been conducted on other species, however, and conclusions were drawn about the threshold levels in dolphins. The threshold level is one that was established theoretically looking at other mammals, and what we find is that our males mostly are in excess of that threshold level where you begin to expect to see health problems or reproductive problems. And we suspect this may be one of the reasons why we see hints of immune system dysfunction in the older males, why we see the older males not living as long as females. Dr. Wells says females are thought to have a longer lifespan because they offload contaminants to their firstborn calves. As they're putting on blubber in preparation for the winter, they're eating a lot of fat-rich fish. And these fish have higher levels of the contaminants than the fish earlier in the year. It goes into the blubber of the dolphins. It stays there until the spring when the animals start to shed some of the lipids that were in their blubber. So as these contaminants are released from the blubber, they either can go to target organs and be a problem. They can be biotransformed into more lethal forms or into less lethal forms. They can be excreted in some cases, or they can be passed on in the milk to the young dolphins. And that's where one of the more serious problems occurs, we believe. We've been able to measure the levels of contaminants in females that have yet to lactate. And they are much higher than they are in older females that have given birth and have lactated. In looking at firstborn calves in Sarasota Bay, we find that they have higher levels of contaminants than do the secondborn, thirdborn, fourthborn, or fifthborn. And most of the firstborn calves don't survive. Coming up, straight ahead. Bottlenose dolphins in the coastal waters of Florida are sentinels of ecosystem health. So we should be concerned. We shouldn't be frightened, but we should be concerned and we should be looking as best we can at those aspects of the environment that impact us as well. Researchers are also studying bottlenose dolphins on Florida's Atlantic coast. The Indian River Lagoon stretches along 40% or 156 miles of the state's central east coast. It is one of North America's most biologically diverse estuaries. We have an estimated population in the Indian River Lagoon of between 800 and as many as 1,000 dolphins. Come up on them a little bit. Steve McCulloch is the founder and program manager of the Marine Mammal Research and Conservation Program at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute in Fort Pierce. Here in the Indian River Lagoon, the primary threats facing dolphins are pollution and contaminants and the water quality. Uh, the lagoon is very sensitive. What goes in the lagoon basically stays in the lagoon. Like their colleagues at Moat Marine Laboratory, each summer, researchers take an in-depth look at the health of the resident dolphins. Each animal receives a full physical exam. The whole process takes about 45 minutes, and during that time, we pull blood. We collect fluid samples, so fecal samples, urine samples, blowhole, gastric, milk, if it's a lactating female. We ultrasonographically look at blubber measurements to see the thickness. We also take a blubber biopsy, and that's a really important data point, and we use the blubber for several different things. We look at different contaminants. We also take the skin to look at genetics, and if it's anything that has the potential to cause pain, they receive a local anesthetic for that area. We want them to be as comfortable as possible, but at the same time collect enough samples so we can get an overall picture of health for each individual. We've looked at about 240 dolphins in five years and found some very disturbing trends. 
For one, mercury levels in these dolphins were 21 times higher than what the Environmental Protection Agency considers safe for human consumption. You wouldn't be allowed to eat a dolphin because the wild dolphins are so contaminated here in Florida. Mercury is a heavy metal that's a, a deadly neurotoxin. In humans, that's been shown to have an effect, especially um, some neurodevelopmental issues, uh, which does obviously pose a significant threat to humans, especially pregnant women who might be eating fish from the lagoon. Mercury is released into the atmosphere from such sources as coal-fired power plants, and it eventually makes its way into the oceans, where it bioaccumulates up the food chain. Experts say they don't exactly know yet what effects high mercury levels have on the dolphins. They do know, however, that the dolphins are also facing other problems. One is a skin disease called lobomycosis. What's unique about this disease is that it's found in dolphins and, and humans only. And it's found in dolphins here in the Indian River Lagoon and also in third world countries and humans that are getting it from their water systems. It's a very challenging disease because to date, we have not been able to culture it in the lab. So without being able to culture it, we don't know how to cure it. Humans, the cure is simply surgical removal. We don't do that with our dolphins because the, the disease is so widespread, you'd essentially have to remove an entire layer of their skin, and that's just not realistic for them. And lobomycosis isn't the only skin disorder found in the Indian River Lagoon dolphins. What we're seeing is lesions on their tongue and lesions in their genital area. And what we know now is that it's a separate papillomavirus specific to the species of dolphin. What's the big deal? Well, the concern is, is that these papillomas or these warts are now converting and becoming cancerous. Experts say the prevalence of various types of cancer has gone up in marine mammals over the years. That's disturbing to me, and it suggests some sort of environmental distress, that something's going on in the environment that's triggering these, these new things. And there's one more troubling discovery. In some of the dolphins we've studied, we're seeing antibiotic-resistant bacteria. The question is, how come? Why? These animals are not given antibiotics. So the theory is that the runoff from sewage from human sources, where humans are treated with antibiotics quite regularly, a lot of these medications, they're not broken down during sewage treatment. So they get in the lagoon and the um, communities of bacteria expose to antibiotics and eventually they do develop a resistance and that population proliferates. It's a big issue with the CDC because potentially what you're doing is breeding bacterial superbugs. These bacteria are resistant to antibiotics that humans would need to take if they got sick with them. The problem is now that the organisms are resistant to those antibiotics. So you're breeding a superbug into the ecosystem that could come back and impact man. Many of these pathogens are zoonotic, which means they can be transmitted from animal to human. Um, so they're really just telling a story about the health of the environment in general, not just the health of dolphins. So it's something we should all take notice of. The exact causal connection between contaminants and the dolphin's illnesses are still unknown. But the scientists agree that the animals' health issues raise red flags. If we were to take all these dolphins that we've examined and sampled, almost 50% of them would be on some sort of medication if they were in a captive facility. Here we go. Again? Dr. Bossert, who is trained as both a pathologist and veterinarian, says in his experience, most dolphins at captive facilities are healthier than their wild counterparts. I think a good degree of that is due to the environmental pressures um, free-ranging dolphins are under right now that these animals here are not. Um, shifts in food supply, uh, global climate change, shifts in water temperatures, new diseases that are emerging uh, that we see in the free-ranging animals like cancer, um, you new infectious diseases, new viruses that these animals don't see. Dr. Bossert conducts regular health checks of the dolphins at Marineland, an oceanarium just south of St. Augustine, Florida. All right, well, here comes Sunny. Good morning, Sunny. 
<laughs> We're gonna do with Sonny here is uh, do a behavioral exam on him, look at him, give him a good physical using trained behaviors. Let's look at his teeth. Right. And you get a good shot there. You look for any cavities, look for any fractures. There's an old fracture here, it's normal. So again, this is a very positive way to, to get uh, really critical health information on these animals because they're able to mask signs of being ill to the point that we can't tell when they're ill. So we have preventive medicine programs. This goes on constantly here. Marine land is also the site of a new dolphin conservation field station, a joint venture between the Georgia Aquarium and Marine Land's Dolphin Conservation Center. Researchers study the wild bottlenose dolphins in this part of Florida, further adding to the understanding of the species. I've got him. We have pretty much the center part of Florida covered with the Indian River Project, and then we have a small study started in Charleston, South Carolina. So the idea is just to connect the dots and see how the health of this species is along the entire east coast. Another person who is actively raising awareness about the plight of dolphins is filmmaker Hardy Jones. Jones has dedicated his career to protecting dolphins. Nicknamed the Dolphin Defender, he has worked with them since the 1970s. Jones was the first to get footage of a pot of dolphins in the wild, and he brought attention to their brutal slaughter off the coast of Japan. Later, he turned his attention to the potential health impacts of contaminants when large numbers of dead dolphins washed up along the east coast of the United States in the late 1980s. There was a great mystery as to what was killing those dolphins, but, but what was known was that they had these, in some cases, astronomical levels of, of chemicals like PCBs and dioxins and things. So, that was a pretty shocking thing. The chemical industry would say, dilution is the solution. In other words, okay, we're pumping this stuff into the oceans, but it will get so diluted that it's not gonna be a problem. But what they didn't reckon on was bioaccumulation. In 1997, the issue of ocean contamination became personal for Jones when he was diagnosed with acute mercury poisoning. I was feeling very fatigued and kind of muddle-headed, and so I, I got a test for mercury. And uh, it came back with the mercury just popping off the chart. So uh, I, I said, well, you know, where did this come from? And at the time, I was eating swordfish and tuna two or three times a week. I thought I was eating really, really healthy food. Fortunately, if you're diagnosed with mercury and you want to get rid of it, you just don't eat fish again, and it will gradually diminish. Fish is an important component in a healthy diet, but people also have to be aware that there are a lot of fish which are not healthy or they're not healthy in um, large amounts. We don't want to discourage people from eating fish and getting those omega-3 fatty acids, which are really important in heart protection, probably cancer protection. But it doesn't do you any good to eat the omega-3s and, and absorb a bunch of mercury or PCBs with it. Jones suspects that it's not just the mercury in fish that can impact human health. When he was diagnosed with cancer, he began to take a closer look at persistent organic pollutants. In 2003, I was diagnosed with um, multiple myeloma, which is a disease that has been on many occasions connected to toxic chemicals. So what I did is I, I got some of my blood tested. I wanted to see you know, what kind of levels do I have. And I got this report, you know, which, which is huge. All of these things are indicating levels of toxic chemicals in my body. So where did I get all this stuff? And so realizing that I had it in me and that the, the scientists that I spoke to, medical people said, well, that's not unusual. I thought it's not unusual to be loaded with these toxic chemicals. Through his organization, bluevoice.org, 
Jones started a project called A Shared Fate, which draws attention to toxic chemicals in the ocean and their potential impact on marine mammal and human health. I just started to see more and more about how these ocean contaminants are connected to disease in not only marine mammals, but in humans. For me, this tie of this disease that I was diagnosed with to the toxins in dolphins that I studied and tried to protect and loved over all these years was kind of a striking irony. Dolphins are magnificent creatures, loved by people around the world. As modern science strives to learn more about their health, one thing is clear. The dolphin's charismatic smile belies the silent threats lurking in their ocean home. If you care what happens to yourself and to your children and your children's children, then you don't have a choice than to care about what happens to these dolphins. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources.